Welcome to Go After Dark. In Go After Dark, we code real-time graphical effects and leave lousy comments in our code. Tonight, we'll take a look at an intro I did way back in 1999. It is a software rendered intro written in Java, taking up about 56 kilobytes of space. It features texture and sample generation, a home written music player, as well as a very simple 3D renderer. In the following episodes, we'll try to convert my old Java code into Go. While doing so, we'll hopefully find some things to improve and hopefully figure out a few things along the way. I will leave a link in the description for the full intro, but for now let's go through it step by step and see which parts it's made out of. So let's take a look at the intro. The first part seems rather uneventful. It is actually there for a reason. The reason is that way back in the day, this was written for Java and machines did not have that much RAM and it had to run in the browser. So to give it a better chance of synchronizing, swapping things in and out, get everything done it wanted to before everything started, a five second pause where it just does almost nothing. So it's it's to give the uh, computer a chance to catch up and become ready for uh, for displaying the uh, the intro. So that's what's going on right here. So the first part is that it uh, begins drawing stuff on the screen. Everything in the intro is rendered in 256 colors. This has a bit of a special shading applied to it. So it splits the screen in two and uh, chooses different colors based on where it is on the screen. Everything is calculated from zero, which is black, all the way up to 255, which is white. So now we begin adding some some more stuff. The, these are some particles that I think they are programmed to be attracted by each other. And there are some lines drawn between each of them. Also a blur effect is uh, applied to make it look a bit more interesting, I guess. The text is a bitmap. It's compressed down to, I think, 16 colors, something like that. These are drawn with primitive drawers. So I have a primitive drawer that can draw circles um, with uh, different sizes, obviously, and these are combined into the shapes on the screen. Same down here. This is circles where a triangle is drawn to crop out parts of the stuff we don't want to, uh, to see. These are a bit crazy looking, mainly because this is running on a machine that's actually too fast. So not all of the effects are timed real time, but instead run as fast as they can, uh, which also up here gives some, some weird effects that is really not something we want. It should just be small distortion of the, uh, of the shape. Um, but um, that's something we can take a look if we can fix. becomes pretty messy because 
the transformations that are applied are way too strong. So hopefully we can make that better. So this is more of a pure 3D scene. It draws um, a distorted torus um, with some weird textures here and there, but some nice funk shading. Um, the color is, uh, instead of being split uh, on the screen, is uh, gray in the middle and gets more and more blue as uh, moved towards the corners. There's some different variations used. Of, uh, of this effect. Down here we have a small version of the same object with the same transformation. It has a lot less faces so it's simpler to draw but it's drawn as a transparent uh, object and it's being blurred so it doesn't look as rough as it maybe otherwise would. So this effect is rather close to uh, one that we've already done on Go After Dark. It's a uh, point cloud. On the right side, there's actually X, Y, and Z rotation. Uh, here we have distance. Um, the camera is moved away from the from the center. So you can see now that rotates, it uh, changes. There's a shaky effect where we actually just change where we draw the draw the screen. Uh, it's a bit cheating but it works quite well. I attempted to make a depth of field effect uh, right here. In uh, I don't think it worked as well as I'd hoped. Maybe if we tweak it a little, we can make it a bit more convincing. So this is the greetings part. We have some funky characters down here. I'm not sure what they actually are. And then we have some bitmaps with the greetings. Again, heavily compressed so it doesn't take up too much space. We have this DNA strand uh, across the color change uh, we, and it's rotating a bit. The entire strand is also rotating a bit, so it changes a bit, but I didn't want to change the, uh, the symmetry of it all. And then we have a rather anticlimactic ending. I think if I've had more time, I would probably have had something going on here, which would have made it significantly better. Also, the artwork is not really that great. All the art is done by me, so uh, it's uh, in varying quality. Some of it is good, and this is not 
some of it. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if we're going to improve, uh, improve on that, but, uh, but anyway, it is what it is. So, um, so yeah, that's it. It's done. It's over. Good. So, uh, let's see if we can begin setting this up and how we will approach this entire thing. So to look at the uh, overall structure of this, I found this thing that I apparently wrote way back in the uh, the day. It kind of describes the the structure of it all. So each of these Java files contains a class. So we have the main class, which is called Beatrice. I had a habit of calling my different demos by by names before they got an official name. So I have a Beatrice, I also have a Carolyn, I have a Darlene. Um, that's some of those I remember at least. The Beatrice contains the main initialization loading stuff and um, it spawns two threads. It spawns a sound player and it spawns a screen handler that is responsible for drawing stuff on the screen. This might seem like a very small number of classes. The reason is that back then each class was put into a jar file, uh, which is really a zip file. In zip files, each file is compressed separately. So if there was a lot of small files, they will compress a lot worse than bigger files. So that actually dictated the structure or let's say lag of structure a lot because you had to cram as much as made sense into a, a single class. Um, so they are huge, have lots of stuff going on, way too much. But in reality, it was needed because in the end, you only had 64 kilobytes of space to work with. So if you used all the space just to have a lot of separate classes, you're kind of limited in what you could do. So we have sound, which contains a tracker player. We'll get more into detail with that. Uh, and for each sample, we also have a separate class. On the graphics side, we have the effects, all of them, <laughs> simply. And we have a bitmap, which also handles drawing all the primitives, everything related to drawing on, uh, on bitmaps. We have a vector handler, which contains 3D scenes. I don't think anything was actually put out here. Um, but yeah, and if you... Uh, you read Danish, then uh, can have a bit of fun with what I wrote back then. With regard to sound, on some of my previous projects, I'd used an MP3 player to play MP3 files. But since we only have 64 kilobytes of space, again, we can't really use MP3s. It will only be a few seconds, maybe. So instead, we use what's called a tracker. I'll see if I can find some footage and put it in the background. Basically, you have some samples that you set up to play your music. You, ha you can adjust uh, volume, all kinds of stuff. So for this, I implemented reading impulse tracker files, or at least partially enough to play back the, uh, the, uh, the song. This is actually some of the documentation that was provided. Quite detailed and actually quite, uh, quite nice. Covers pretty pretty well what you uh, what you need so the tracker files are opened and basically it strips out all the information except the samples it doesn't record the samples because they are too big for us instead it stores the basic information so we read through the uh, the information store it on the side then there's a general script that generates the samples. So here we have a sample, we just give it a name called sinus um, and number one. So it replaces instrument number one in the tracker. Um, we can set it as a sine wave, a square wave, triangle, sawtooth or white noise. Set a length in milliseconds, a bass frequency, 
um, set a sample rate for it. Um, you can define volume, how the volume changes over time. You can add a low frequency oscillator, which changes the frequency over time. You can add a low pass filter to it with various settings. Then there's some effects like you can distort it, you can do some stuff that uh, made sense at the time, but generally to make it more interesting, you can add harmonics. So you can add a sawtooth that's 12 half notes offset. So that's an octave, this is two octaves, this is at the same frequency and so on. And you can set the uh, the the volumes of these. Um, so yeah, that there's uh, what it does is it passes through each sample. It stores the data to reconstruct it in a binary format, so it doesn't take up too much uh, too much space. Then it writes out the sample as a WAV file, so you can import it back into the tracker and listen to how it sounds. And basically, these can then be recombined to have the tracker information with when to play which sounds and the samples that are generated. But for now, let's put aside the sound code and that part of it. It'll definitely be something we'll return to and take a look at. But for now, let's see if we can set up the basics of the graphics drawing in Go. So let's take a look at uh, setup for drawing our intro. So I set up small test setup here. So create a gray image to write to. Uh, we also create a full RGB image, which will be our destination when we do our color conversion. Then we create our intro and uh, can just go in and take a look. So we pass the gray image we want to draw the first effect to. We store it. Um, we check if we cleared the screen. We do that on the first time the effect is run. Otherwise, we actually don't clear the screen since there's no need to. We figure out the top and the bottom line of the image, which is where we'll draw our effect. We figure out where we are. Then we have a draw line function that draws a horizontal line. It takes uh, the pixels as a slice, the color we want to set, the start and the stop index in the binary. So it simply draws two lines. It draws a small white one and a gray one and the same on the top, and it does it on the bottom. That's the only thing it does. Let's take a look at how it looks in reality. So here we go. We can follow them on the top and the bottom. The effect just repeats, but that's enough to draw the start of our intro. Then I set up the beginning of the, um, the title screen. We give it the gray screen and the full color screen. It's set to this resolution. This resolution was chosen because you would set your resolution of your screen to 640 by 480. So this almost fills the entire width of the screen. And this is just a proportional size that uh, I thought uh, worked quite well. So. Let's go into the title. So we accept the gray image and the RGB image we'll be outputting to. For now, we simply clear the screen and set it to a fixed color. Then we have a transfer function that does nothing. And um, hopefully we can fill that out with the stuff that colorizes our picture. So I found my old code that was responsible for that. So let's take a look at that. Here we go. So we have a nice function called gather half color. It's part of a screen handler class that does all kinds of stuff. 
the first thing we have is a lot of variables that isn't used. But hey, this is Java, so we don't really have to care about that, right? So it seems like I've been doing some calculations over here at uh, one point. So this is probably the two colors we want to hit. And down here we have three loops that ranges over our image. So we find out based on our height where on the horizontal axis we should do our split. Uh, we have an offset counter that counts until we reach our split. Then we range over the width of the image. This calculates where we are writing. And here we get the input value that we are working with. A thing to uh, note is that the entire intro is written with kind of a weird layout for the pixels. Since lookups were fairly expensive in Java because of force bounds check, just like in Go, the entire screen is actually 32-bit uh, integers. So we could do a single lookup to get four pixels or write four pixels. And usually there would be something that contained this temporary value. So this is also why we have this small loop that does uh, four iterations. This is simply to, um, to go through all the, uh, the pixels in our input. The first thing we do is to check whether we are on the left side or the right side of the split. Then there's a check if we are above or equal to 192. If we are that, we use one equation, otherwise we use another equation. That's so it goes from black to color to white. And basically down here it's the same, but with a different color. And finally, we write our output pixel, which contains all three values and we move our offset. We increment the byte shift. So we shift down more. And finally here we increment the X offset. So we know where we are in terms of the split. In overall terms, this is not crazy. In general though, I'd say it could be done a bit more efficient. I would probably use two lookups and simply use from zero to where the split is with one table and then move on to another table. So we didn't have to do this if check for every pixel. It seems uh, kind of silly looking back at it. So at least there's something we can improve. But let's try to uh, to move this over and uh, see if we can make any sense of this. So the first thing I'll do is to add um, the lookup tables. Let's call them color. And we'll be looking up bytes. We need two of them. And so that means two and 256. So this is indicating whether we are on the left or the right side. Then we look up the byte value of our input. And since we are doing RGBA, we will add a color.RGBA value as the final value we, uh, we want. So up here, instead of returning, we call this T, something like that. That's fine. We can return it at the end. And then we can do a simple range over 256. So let's do that. We actually just lazy and need the index, but we look it up anyway. So well, whatever. We convert it to a slice. So I is the input value, and we want to store the two output values in our color. So let's see if we can 
transfer some code. So if I There we go. So now we just need to fill out the other cases. Let's do that. So now we have the colors on the left and the right side below and equal to 192. Let's fill out the upper part of this. So just to make this a bit more clear, all of these give 255 when added together. So if this is 64, then we should end up with 255, meaning white, for, uh, for all values. So these are the RGB values that are the base color we want at 192. So... So let's try to implement this. Okay, so it seems like with some copy paste, we are about to be set up. So when we transfer it, we go through each line, we calculate where we want to do the switch, and then we find the source and destination we want to use. Since we are writing four pixels, for every input, we want to make sure that we have enough. So first we do on the left side of, of where we want to change the color. So we range over that part. Then we look up the color we want. And then we simply write the output values. So one plus two well, plus three this, this 255 is not really needed but we do it anyway so 
red, green, and blue. And we do the right side. Copy paste is, of course, an important part of this. So instead of having to do all kinds of weird offsets and stuff, we simply re-slice our line slices. Start with the source. The destination. So that way we can be lazy and we don't have to change anything down here. So let's cross our fingers and uh, see if this does anything. So yeah, we've uh, got a line across the screen and we got two different colors. Let's try some other input values. So let's say we want a byte that is t times 255 so it should go from 0 to 255 so it should go from black to the color to white black color white black color. that's a weird something weird going on so yeah something is wrong here seems like it's the lower part of the image let's check the values we have so left that should be this okay. so. So yeah, it seems like we found a bug in uh, our old code. Let's see if we can fix it. I think the problem is this isn't scaled correctly. Let's bring up a calculator. Yeah, it seemed like um, we hadn't scaled this value correctly. Not that I knew that it was a problem, but uh, good, good to know. Fixed the bug. So uh, hey, that's our first improvement. And yeah, looks uh, looks fine. So yeah, fixed the first bug already. Seems uh, like this will be an interesting journey. So this wraps up the first episode of this new thing. Thank you for watching the seventh episode of Go After Dark. I hope you enjoyed it. Of course, I would really appreciate any feedback you may have. If you find this interesting, if there's other things we should cover, if we are moving too fast or too slowly, feel free to leave a comment below. In the next episode, we'll continue to investigate our code, begin to draw some stuff on the screen, and hopefully find some interesting bugs as well. Until then, you can visit afterdark.classpost.com where there's a link to the source code and you can see the previous episodes as well. Be sure to do all the regular stuff, subscribe, follow on Twitter, all that. If you have anything you'd like to share, and maybe we should take a look at, then 
Use the hashtag GoAfterDark on Twitter. But it has been a pleasure, and I hope you like the new stuff we're doing. So thank you for your time, and good night.